Good morning and aloha, and welcome to Law Across the Sea. I am Mark Schlaff, the host of Law Across the Sea. And the purpose of Law Across the Sea, this program, is to bring lawyers who travel across the sea to and from Hawaii to talk about what they have found and what they have brought and take with them on their travels. Today our guest is Peter Esser. Peter is a lawyer in Hawaii who has an appellate practice and with whom I've done several cases. Peter has written over 250 appeals in Hawaii and has appeared before the Hawaii appellate courts numerous times. However, there's another facet of Peter's life experience that takes him across the sea and into exotic places where he uses photography to appeal to the senses. We're going to talk about both his legal practice and his avocation today. Welcome, Peter. Good, good to see you. Good to be here. Uh, first of all, my first question is, what is an appellate lawyer? What does, well, what does an appellate lawyer do? When, uh, when someone is dissatisfied with a verdict, uh, either in criminal court or family court or civil court, and, and they want the record reviewed by appellate courts, they come to an appellate lawyer, uh, you file a notice and you write briefs. Most of the time the appeals are decided on the brief, so what I spend most of my time doing is sitting in front of a word processor drafting briefs. Occasionally they'll set oral argument. Uh, I've appeared in front of the Hawaii Supreme Court about 150 times in oral argument, also the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and uh, it's a great job these days because of uh, uh, e-filing. You can pretty much do everything at home. On the internet. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. not only for you to file, but also access to the record. Okay, now, you know, not every lawyer is an appellate lawyer, right? I mean, not, I mean, I guess every lawyer could appeal their case, but they come to an appellate lawyer because the appellate lawyer has some background experience in doing that, knows the system. Is that? That's correct. And, and most trial lawyers know that a big part of their practice is, is rules and procedure. You can't present your on story. On appeal, on appeal. Well, and, and in trial court. Oh, yeah, that's you true. Can't, like, you cannot litigate something unless you know the structure. Uh, that's, that's what makes us professionals and experts. And, of course, one of the things I argue is that good trial lawyers should hire good <laughs> appellate lawyers to take the appeal because it's a whole different uh, kind of law. Uh, and and uh, I do almost every area. Uh, whereas most trial lawyers specialize like in family or criminal defense or whatever. And how long have you been doing appellate practice? Uh, since 75 when I, gra well, when I uh, passed my first bar in California. Okay, and you like that? You like the appellate? Uh, appellate yeah, I, I mean I, I sort of ended up in it because I w was uncomfortable uh, with the stress of trial work and also I like the intellectual challenge of, uh, of appellate work. You, you take issues that, that trial lawyers don't have time to spend so many hours on and you, like I usually put in 75 to 100 hours on a brief, right. and that allows me to really get in depth, and, and that's the part I like. And, and you, you have the ability, the luxury of time in a way, uh, more, a little, not, there are still deadlines, of course, in appellate pr practice, but you can put your mind into the topic a little bit more. Is that, is that? That's correct. And, and, and as a lawyer, you know that deadlines are great because if you are not working on a brief, and watching a movie or reading a book or going on a trip when you're supposed to be working, it's always much more fun. Yeah, well, I want to talk about that, really. I mean, and, and a, a different type of appeal. Yeah. Uh, what, I, I, I've known you for several years, and I've seen many of your photographs and a lot of your galleries of, of photographs. How did you ever get into photography? The, the beautiful photos that you take are, are just outstanding, and we're going to go through a few of them only a few of them today, but how did you get into photography? There's basically two reasons to take photos. One is because I have a bad memory and I want to remember what I've seen. Uh, and, and also, when you take a photograph, it records things you may not have even seen when you were there. Mm. Uh, and lots of times I get home and study a photograph and see things that I didn't know about. That's like a, a classic movie I've seen. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, and the second uh, big reason is the way it makes you look. Uh, whenever I show up at a, at a site, like say the Parthenon in Athens or, or Salisbury Cathedral, uh, I'm, I'm studying the light and looking at the angle and, and seeing artistically what 
what it is so I can make it into a beautiful photograph. Uh, and, uh, and it just makes me look. Uh, one of the things I frequently do is show up at a monument at the wrong time of day uh, and get uh, where the light's wrong, where it's behind my subject. And so I literally uh, leave and come back uh, eat later in the day when the sun's right. Whenever I visit a monument of any kind, m my eyes are where I need to be to get the light right, because light is everything in photography. And ha have you all? I mean, have you been a photographer since uh, I, you were a young child, or have, is this something that you yes. developed? Yes, I, I had a box camera, a brownie camera, uh, when I was like six or seven. How did you get into that? Well, you know, part of this comes from the kind of movies I liked. In the fifties, <laughs> there were epic movies. There was Ben Hur, and there was King of Kings, and that sort of thing. And, and I always loved the cinematic uh, part of movies, the images, especially the widescreen images. And uh, so the natural thing was to take photos. And of course, most people take photos of people, especially relatives. Right. They, t they, they put the camera away unless it's Christmas or birthdays. And, and I pretty much uh, only photograph people when I travel. And I do it with a long lens. And I do it with an autofocus. And most of the time, they don't know. Uh, because adults get all weird when you take their photo. The only natural subjects of photography are little kids, and I photograph little kids all the time because they're wonderful subjects. Uh, but mostly what I do is photograph ar architecture, and I have a fascination with ruins. So if a country doesn't have ruins, I usually don't go there. <laughs> and and you've, you had this, this, uh, this interest in photography since you were a young child, and you've tied it to, to movies and, and it, is, it, is it something that you, you must do? Is it, is it part of your life now that you have to do these uh, photography? Absolutely and, and it has evolved over the decades because of the technology and the biggest change happened to me 10 years ago when I finally abandoned medium format film work which was a big huge uh, uh, manual focus camera that took very slow uh, studied photographs and went to uh, um, to digital cameras mm -hmm. and uh, and the great thing about there's lots of great things about digital uh, uh, and I know there are still film photographers reluctant to leave behind this sort of classic photography but the wonderful thing is you get to develop your own pictures and and when you are you can develop a film uh, but it's very complex and do you do that uh, no I never all I did was take my photos in like everyone else to uh, longs or wherever and uh, and sometimes uh, make enlargements and object and ask them to do specific things it took forever and and it was still being done by another artist not me mm -hmm. and when the first thing I discovered when I got into digital is how you could you could uh, adjust contrast and color and light and, and especially cropping and rotating. I have a tendency to take cro crooked photographs. I don't know it's because like I'm uh, just like out of focus, you know, I don't know what it is, but about 50% of my photos are, are, uh, need to be rotated, straightened up. And, and uh, frequently you need to crop. What, one of the things you need to do is to get a camera that has a very high uh, 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 grain, uh, expensive, but uh, it, it, lots of megapixels. And what you get is you can reduce the image down to interesting things within, and you won't lose the focus. Okay. And I've asked you to bring 20 of your favorite photos today. And I'd like to kind of go through them one at a time uh, as best we can. I'd like you to take a look at them and explain what we're looking at. And All we're, right. We're going we're to... First, we're going to talk about the one from Bali. I mean, okay, what is this? Is actually from New Guinea, and and uh, let me just briefly say how I decide where I'm going, especially now that because I've, I've visited most of the major places in the world I wanted to go to, and so I'm finding myself going back to a lot of them. One, the best vacation is to go back to some place familiar, and then take a side trip to some place you haven't been. And and this is a Danny hut in the Balian Valley in uh, in New Guinea in the, in the uh, western side of New Guinea that is part of Indonesia. And it, right in the middle of Indonesia is Bali. I've been to Bali a dozen times. It's one of my favorite places in the world. And I go there and stay at a hotel I've always stayed at before. And then I plan these side trips to new places. I don't photograph Bali much anymore. That's Bali uh, because I've been there so many times and taken so many photos. That's the biggest uh, uh, 
That's the Basak Temple uh, up on the side of the volcano in Bali, which I've been to many times. Well, there's lots of towers. And, yeah, uh, uh, and that's probably around 1,500 years old, although, of course, they're rebuilding and taking care of it all the time. Uh, that is a, a very famous stupa in Kathmandu in Nepal, which is Tibetan, where huge numbers of Tibetans back in the 50s when they had to abandon uh, Lhasa, which I've also been to, uh, came and lived because of the Chinese. And uh, uh, that was severely damaged in the earthquake uh, 18 months ago, and it's been restored. So in this photo here, I, there, who are those eyes? Who are the uh, eyes of? That is an image of the Buddha uh, and unique to the Kathmandu Valley. I don't even think they have those uh, eyes in Tibet, which is, of course, where all these people came from. It is, it is a combination of Hindu and, and Buddhist art in Kathmandu. Kathmandu is an extraordinary place. Uh, most of the city is 500 years old and hasn't changed. It's a medieval city in, in, uh, in Asia. And it's, what are those What are those flags? Those are that... prayer flags which have Om Mani Padme Hum, which is the, uh, the Sanskrit thing that says the jewel is in the lotus. I don't want to get too technical. Those, there are actually uh, streets up above Kapilani Park where people have those flags. Uh, they're all around the world. And what happens is when they wave in the wind, they say, Om Mani Padme Hum, which means the jewel is in the lotus. It's a, it's a Buddhist uh, prayer. Okay, now, and just going back for a second to the Bali photo. The Bali photo, wh what, what temple is that? That's I mean, a Hindu temple. Hindu, okay. Bali's the only Hindu island left in Indonesia. I Most see. of Indonesia is Muslim now. Uh, so that is a huge Hindu temple which I said goes back about 1,500 years. And this is an annual festival where pe people are making a pilgrimage to this temple. Uh, I just hit a perfect time, just serendipity. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Let, uh, uh, all right, let, let's, before our break, let's take a look at the uh, Easter Island. Okay. Th this is kind of a, I, I've seen this before, but the, these, these figures, but this is a little different. Yeah, this uh, is the, the volcano, uh, extinct volcano, on the island. Uh, uh, Easter Island's about the size of, uh, say, Lanai, very small island. And this is where they were uh, dug out of the ground, and, and then they would bury these, these basalt chunks of, of stone in the ground and then work on them. And uh, I, uh, this is a island that is one of the most remote islands in the world, like Hawaii. And there's a, a Lan Chile flight from Tahiti to Santiago, Chile, that stops here. Uh, and I went there with a lawyer friend from here, and uh, my son was uh, a Stanford student at uh, San Diego doing uh, foreign exchange, and I stopped uh, in, in uh, East Island on the way. Absolutely incredible place, and uh, I have a whole gallery on the visit, but that, those were all taken okay. with an with a early camera, and so the quality is not very good. I just love the image. Looks, looks great to me. And yeah. we're going we're gonna to come back and hopefully be able to get through the rest of your 20 right. in about a minute. Okay. Okay? Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Hello and aloha. My name is Raya Salter, and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to figure out how we're going to work towards a clean and renewable energy future. We have exciting conversations with all kinds of stakeholders, everyone who needs to come together to talk about renewable energy, be they engineers, advocates, lawyers, utility executives, musicians, or artists, to see how we can come together to make a renewable future. Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Aloha, I'm Carl Campagna. I hope you please visit us this summer. It's a wonderful summer. It's actually a cooler summer than we're used to. But I hope that you come back and visit us and watch our show, Education, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, here on Think Tech Hawaii. It's at noon every Wednesday. See you then. We are back uh, with Peter Esser, and we are going through his photographs of the world. And they cover just about every place that's exotic and different from Hawaii that we can imagine. And we're gonna, we're gonna just start back where we left off, and we're, we're in Turkey right now uh, and again this was one of those places where I showed up at 
uh, four in the afternoon, and the light was on the back of the uh, library, the famous library at uh, uh, Ephesus, which is on the coast of Turkey. And I came, I came back, paid another admission fee the next morning at 9, and the light was perfect, as you can see. That was reconstructed by a German archaeologist in, in the early 60s. Uh, it's one of the great images of any Roman ruin. It, it dates from about the time of Hadrian, maybe like 130. And of course, that, uh, those, those uh, sculptures, some of which have survived, are, uh, are myths. Th those, are, th those are Roman gods, so this is pre-Christian. Uh, another couple hundred years before the Ro Rome adopted uh, Christianity. And, and, you know, considering everything that's going on in Turkey today, uh, it's just, to put this in context, it, yeah, it is amazing, you know. It is, and Turkey is an extraordinary place to go as a tourist because it's been a center of civilization for thousands and thousands of years, so there, there are ruins at almost every epoch in history and also every religion. Okay, let's, let's go to the, the, next, the next photo. Oh, this is a beautiful, this is a Buddha. I, yeah. I, even, it, even I know this. There's yeah. a, actually a dispute <laughs> as to whether or not this is Buddha or Ananda, one of his disciples, uh, but uh, okay. it's certainly Buddhist. One of the most wonderful Buddha images in the world from Sri Lanka. The face uh, is great. It, it's extraordinary. By the way, there's, this appears in a wonderful movie with Elizabeth Taylor and Dana Andrews, uh, back in the in the mid 50s uh it, this image is carved in granite it's about uh i would say a thousand years old it's in palinarua which is a city that was abandoned in about 1200 uh, a.d and, and where was this in in sri lanka, sri, sri lanka. Uh, okay. uh it's one of what they call the ancient cities in sri lanka sri lanka is one of the most extraordinary places in the world to visit for ruins and for beautiful uh scenery and just everything. Uh, okay. I, was, I was there 24 years ago. I haven't been back. I'm planning to go back. Of all of the islands in Asia I have been to, uh, Sri Lanka is probably my favorite. All right, let, let's move to Japan. All right, this is a beautiful, beautiful castle like in Japan. Where is it? This is Himeji Castle, uh, which is north of uh, Osaka. There's also a castle in Osaka, but it's uh, cement, and this is, this is an original wood one that is about 900 years old. It's one of the oldest surviving all wood buildings in the world. Uh, another one, by the way, is the Budo Inn, which is in Kyoto, and we have a copy out here in Kaneohe. Um, I, I was lucky enough to be there during uh, Konami, I think I'm pronouncing it right, which is the, the week each year when the cherry blossoms uh, are in bloom. Uh, strangely enough, this shot doesn't show any cherry blossoms. It is an absolutely magnificent castle, and there's a bullet train from Osaka to Himeji, so you get there really quickly from Kansai Airport. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Oh, wow. This is probably my favorite photograph Ever. Uh, this is the Dalai Lama's palace in Lhasa, which is very difficult to get to and is 12,000 feet high. The mountains you see in the background are probably 18,000. Like Cusco in Peru, you have to be very careful about altitude sickness. Uh, I was sucking oxygen out of a, 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 of a bag at the hotel in order to avoid uh, a lot of side effects. This, there's a very large enlargement of this photo at the Supreme Court that has been there for about 12 years. Supreme Court of Hawaii. Yes. Uh, it was put up by the clerks there, and it is in the uh, clerk's office when you walk in. It is, is probably my favorite photo I've ever taken. It was taken with a medium format film camera, and, and they had just repainted the, the palace. Now, the Dalai Lama doesn't live in it anymore. He lived in it up until 1959 when he was forced out by the Chinese. He now lives in northwest India in a hill station. All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's take a look at the next, the next photo. I, uh, oh, my gosh. Uh, th that grass really makes the yeah. shot. Uh, this is Machu Picchu, which has the Hawaii connection because of yeah. Bingham. Right. Uh, Hiram Bingham was an extraordinary archaeologist, but he also is the grandson wow. of the, the famous missionary uh, that, that our streets named after here in Honolulu. Uh, it's an extraordinary place, but Peru as a country is an extraordinary place. Cusco is at least, if not more, fascinating than Machu Picchu. 
Uh, and even Lima is an extraordinary place. Uh, a lot of Hawaiians, uh, people from Hawaii, have been to Peru, and and all of them loved it. Okay, let, let, let's let's take a look at our next our next shot. Ah, okay. uh, this is probably one of the best preserved Greek temples in the world, and it's not in Greece. It's in uh, along the coast of Italy, uh, south of Salerno. It's called Paestum. It is unlike the temples that are famous in Athens. It's limestone. It's not uh, made out of. That's why it looks so so beat up because uh, the marble temples in Athens are, uh, have been, uh, hold their shape better. It, absolutely incredible day, right in springtime, perfect blue sky. Uh, I took all of a, of a couple of dozen photographs of Paestum. There's four major temples in about an hour, and it's some of the most treasured photographs I've ever taken of Greek temples. Okay, let's look at the next. Oh, okay. I've seen this in a movie somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, this was the Indiana Jones, uh, I think it was the third movie, uh, the one with uh, Sean Connery. Um, this is a temple that, uh, well, uh, when Obama went to uh, Amman to visit with a king, he insisted on going south down to uh, Petra, the, the city of red stone. And he visited the treasury, which is the most famous landmark there. This is the the, the, the <laughs> this is another monument that you have to hike to that ba Obama missed. He was there a week before I was down below. Uh, it's it's one of the seven wonders of the world. It's an incredible place. Uh, I can't say enough about Petra. All right, let's let's take a look at our next. Ooh, okay, now I, I... this is probably the oldest tourist site in the world. Yeah. There were Roman tourists going here uh, 500 years before Christ. Uh, th these three pyramids represent father, son, and grandson, uh, and uh, were the tallest buildings in the world until the 19th century. Okay, nice. and it's an amazing place. One of my favorite architectural uh, things from the Roman times are the aqueducts. In other words, not the religious buildings, but the secular buildings. This is a restored aqueduct in Seville, north of Madrid that dates from the time of Trajan, probably around 100 AD. And it goes right through the middle of town and carries water from a river about 12 miles away uh, to the city of Seville. And, it, and it's still working. It, and it's still working. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, and it's, it, it, that's the sole reason I went to Spain on this trip, was right. to see this aqueduct. Let's, let's take the next one. Ooh, OK, I've been here. Uh, talk about icons. This is one. I've, I've been here, I can't remember, it's two or three times. This is at sunset. Taj Mahal. Uh, it beautiful. is the Taj Mahal. And then the water, the water reflecting it is yeah, beautiful. Yeah, in Agra. Believe it or not, in the 19, late 19th century, this was so overgrown you could barely see it because the Brits uh, basically ignored it until they decided it was an important monument. <laughs> and they cleaned out the gardens and stopped taking uh, marble away to use on contemporary buildings. And of course, it's, it's probably the most iconic tourist site in the world other than the pyramids. Okay. This is a tiny little monastery. It's beautiful. In Bhutan, which is in northeast of India, uh, which is elevation from say seven to 14,000 feet high. This is about 10,000. It's a five mile, five hour hike up the side of the cliff to get here. And you took the hike. And I took the hike, one of the great hikes they've ever taken. It's only two hours back down. This, this burned down uh, a year before I was there, and they have rebuilt most of it here. They still have another couple of buildings to add on the left. Uh, it's called the Tiger's Nest, uh, and it's a very famous Buddhist monastery. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Tibetan, uh, but it's in Bhutan, okay. and Bhutan's an extraordinary place. Ah, this, this, is, this I love. This another very, yeah. uh, one of my very famous, this is photographs, this is a picture of the north face gate to Tapram at Angkor Wat. Tapram's the overgrown ruin. Most of the ruins, including Angkor Wat, they've cleaned off the vegetation uh, to preserve it and also so you can see it. Uh, Tapram, they've left behind all of the, the uh, trees and the overgrowth, and it makes it very romantic and great setting for a lot of great movies. Uh, every time I go, I've been here three times to Angkor, I hike out to that. It's about... Uh, oh, I don't know, a couple of hundred yards away from the main temple, and no one else goes there, so it's a very peaceful, wonderful spot. Again, those are, that, those are Buddhist images. Um, this is Tikal in Central America, uh, in northern um, Guatemala. 
uh, dates from about 900, 800 AD, is probably the most famous Mayan temple. Uh, completely overgrown when it was rediscovered in the 1860s by, uh, by I think, an American archaeologist. Uh, no, actually British, Ma Maudsley, I think. But anyway, uh, it's literally the national symbol of Guatemala now. It's on their flag, it's, it's uh, on their uh, currency, uh, and it's just an extraordinary building. You can't climb up anymore. Oh, okay, now, um, oh, okay, we, we got a couple more, but... Okay, this is the Royal Palace in Bangkok, which I've mm. visited over and over and over again because Bangkok's a great hub for seeing all sorts of places in Southeast Asia. This is on one of those very unique days when Bangkok doesn't have Southeast Asian skies, which are muddy and gray and make for horrible photography. Mm -hmm. I looked out the window of my hotel and saw that sky and dashed over there to photograph it. This is the Shwedagon Pagoda in Burma, which I just visited in October after 22 years after my first visit. This dates about 2,000 years back. It's Buddhist and supposedly there are hairs of the Buddha underneath. It's, it's, it's still an active religious site where pilgrims come from all over Asia and especially from Burma and, uh, and do a pilgrimage around the, the oh, base of it. Okay. Absolutely extraordinary site. The top half has about 22 tons of gold oh. on it. Yeah. And there's a uh, diamond at the top that is 72 carats. Absolutely extraordinary. One of my favorite sites in Asia. I think we got one more. This, this is, is our last This one. is Laos's claim to fame. Again, a pagoda like that last shot. Uh, very little gold, funky, looks like, some people think it looks like a, a ballistic missile site. <laughs> uh, again, this is on all of the, the, the national seal, the money, the everything. This is, this is a national symbol of Laos. I absolutely love Laos, uh, uh, and that's why this is important to me. Well, P Peter, we've had to rush through 20 <laughs> photos, which I'm, I'm glad we did. I liked them all. Um, now, if somebody wants to take a little bit more time to go through your photos, where, where would they go? Well, I post them on a, on a website called Smug Mug, and my, uh, uh, you access my galleries by uh, typing in ESSER 47, which year I was born, uh, space smug mug s m u g m u g. There's about a hundred gallery, galleries galleries in the travel section, and each of these uh, individual photos came from galleries with you know fifty to a hundred other photos of the same thing. Well, thank you, and you know I, I think you've uh, you've won this appeal. <laughs> all right, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate you going through all uh, going through these photos. I, I I love the one you know the the, the various re religious photos. I mean, are, are, are beautiful. Uh, taking it apart from the religion, just the architecture and, and the, the, the work that went into them is, is It lovely. becomes much more fascinating when you study the iconography, when you figure out what it means, what, because all of them have connections. Just like when you go into a church, the, the cross means something and, and the Statue of Mary means something. It's the same thing in Hindu temples and uh, in Buddhist pagodas, the, and if you study the iconography, even without studying the religious faith, uh, you, you can you enjoy a lot more. Yeah, that's okay. part of it.